Welcome everyone to the sixth annual State of Media Summit. Uh, my co-founder, Christine Corneva Walker, will give the introduction and tell you a bit about the history, then we'll jump into some data and we'll get to our fantastic expert panel. Over to you, Christine. Welcome everyone. I can't believe that it's been another year and we still have not been able to move on from the pandemic. But hopefully soon, really, we'll have a chance to organize an in-person summit in the near future. For those of you who are new to the summit, the birth of the summit took place in Provincetown, Massachusetts, where I am now, fittingly during a nor'eastern storm, where 125 thought leaders from the across the country and beyond came together to brainstorm strategies to address the lack of equity and inclusion in US entertainment media. At the time, we called it the Women's Media Summit, but since then, all of us have been working to address the concerns, us and you have been working to address the concerns in various ways and have expanded our focus to include a host of other underserved populations, recognizing that we share collective concerns and that an intersectional approach could yield more illuminating results, not just about forms in which discrimination takes place, but about the strategies to address those concerns. In addition, we recognize the necessity to track our progress in the industry and are thrilled to deepen our partnership over the years with the Representation Project and the Center for Intersectional Media and Entertainment. Our format today will proceed as follows. Rebecca will, represent, will present the report card followed by a panel discussion moderated by my fearless partner in crime, Caroline Heldman. Um, we'll leave time for questions and then wrap up some time within the hour. So thank you for, for being here and would love to hear from you, Rebecca. All right, um, so I'll be sharing my screen right now. I'm excited to share with you all the findings from um, the State of Media Report Card 2022. So we put this, um, this report together last year and updated it for this uh, State of Media Summit. Um, so I will take you through it. First off, just wanted to again, shout out our lovely sponsors and expert panel for this event. Um, in the spirit of collaboration in this media space, it's really exciting to uh, present to you uh, data from all different organizations doing incredible work. Um, in uh, benchmarking media representation. So to start off, a project overview. Um, so today I'm going to share with you quickly a massive amount of data um, from all over the place. Uh, we're looking specifically at uh, representations of film, TV, advertising, video games, and music. Um, and we wanna be able to establish benchmarks um, in in each of these industries for these big six identities. So gender, race, age specifically, we're looking at um, people over 50, uh, disability, body size, we're looking at representations of fat people. Um, and I will take this moment to also mention that the rep project is part of a growing collective that is reclaiming the word fat strategically and, and using it as an, not an insult in um, ways that hopefully will help us to fight uh, fat, fat, fat hatred and fat phobia better. So I use that word intentionally. Um, and then also sexuality, we're looking at representations of LGBTQ plus folks in these sectors as well. Um, another thing to note, there's so much data here. We're mostly focusing on, actually exclusively focusing on the amount of representation, um, but there's so much to be said about the quality of representation too. So if you're interested in that, um, I would definitely recommend checking out our other reports and reports from the other uh, orgs that we are pulling from in this report too. So our sources, um, there are so many great people and orgs and institutes doing this work. Um, this particular report card pulls from the Hollywood Diversity Report at UCLA, the Gina Davis Institute on Gender and Media, um, the USC, the Annenberg Inclusion Initiative, also San Diego State University, the Center for uh, Study for this Center for the Study of Women in Television and Film. Um, we're also using data from the Writers Guild and Directors Guild, from GLAAD, and of course, um, from the Representation Project too. So uh, let's get into it. And I also will say there's so much here, I'm gonna blow through it, but um, no need to, to write anything down because this is all going to be in the report card, which will be shared in the chat and also is published. Um, we can share afterwards as well. Um, it, it's all there and then some. So let's start off with the state of film. So. This is both on screen and behind the scenes. 
All right, to start off, women characters in film over the last decade. Um, we see that women in film are still underrepresented. So we're benchmarking to US population and women make up 50.8% of the US population, but are still outnumbered two to one um, by men in, in films and the US films today. And we'd see a little bit of progress, but not much over the last decade. When we look at actual screen time by gender, it's a little bit worse. So women are inching closer to uh, reaching parity in film, but not so much when it comes to actual time spent on screen. We're seeing that women are still um, not showing up in, in equitable ways to their men counterparts. For BIPOC characters in film, we have seen some steady progress in the last decade, and we're excited to see that this last year, 2021, um, is the first year in this decade that uh, BIPOC characters have achieved parity, which is awesome. So in 2021, 45.8% of characters were BIPOC in film. Um, and of course, we're benchmarking to the US population. So that's 39.9% of the US. Um, so that's an awesome trend we hope to see continue move upwards. Um, and also an uh, important moment to note that quality of representation matters too. So this is a, an area where that research is also needed. Um, and we need to advocate for better representations in addition to this incredible finding. Um, when we look at screen time, we do still see that characters with light skin tones are still outnumbering characters with medium and dark skin tones twice as much um, when it comes to actual time on screen. For characters in film, that are LGBTQ plus. Uh, we have a new, this is exciting to research nerds. We have a new Gallup poll that, uh, and we've seen an uptick in the amount of LGBTQ plus people in the US. So it's now, our baseline is now 7.1%. Um, that said, not great news when it comes to representation in film. We see that LGBTQ plus characters are almost entirely erased. Uh, very little progress over the decade. We see some um, re representation starting to happen in 2018 and 2019, but we're, we're not seeing a whole lot in the last couple of years. So a lot, uh, a long ways to go for LGBTQ plus characters in film. Same thing with uh, folks with disabilities. So when we're looking at disability, we're looking at characters, we're measuring for characters that have physical disabilities, cognitive communication disabilities, um, and also uh, mental health disabilities. So 26% of the US population has one of those four disabilities. Uh, we we see that characters with disabilities are virtually missing from film in the last decade with not a whole lot of trend upwards. Um, when it comes to characters 50 plus, so we're looking at representations of older adults, 34.2% of the US are over 50 and we see not a lot of representation, uh, especially in the last few years in film. Um, not a lot of progress either over the last um, 10 years. So. Um, characters are still characters over 50 are still being outnumbered um, by characters under 50 not and not quite enough to make it to the the population this number gets even worse when we look at actual screen time so even when characters are being cast in film um, characters over 50 are not showing up um, as much on screen so you can see let me go back a slide 18.4 uh, percent of characters were over 50 in 2021 films but they only saw 9.7 percent screen time and when we look at uh, fat characters, we see similar trends. 42.5% um, of the US population is fat or uh, has large body type. And we see that only in 2021, only 10.8% of characters were fat. Um, and this trend has pretty much stayed the same over the decade with not, uh, no improvement. Again, even worse when we're looking at screen time. So 10.8% of characters were fat in 2021, but only 4.2% of screen time focused on faces of fat characters. All right, and when we look at behind the scenes in film, um, a lot of the behind the scenes trends are gonna look very similar. Uh, the story here is that women are pretty much have historically been erased as film directors um, and, and in key behind the scenes roles. Um, so when we look specifically at film directors, you can see in 2010, which was not too long ago, only 2% of films were directed by women. Um, we've seen quite a bit of improvement over the last 10 years, but uh, still have a long way to go in terms of achieving parity. When it comes to BIPOC film directors, it's the same story. Uh, very underrepresented at the beginning of the decade. And we've seen a lot of improvement over the decade and still have a long way to go in terms of getting um, to parity. Oh, well, there we go. When it comes to screenwriters, this is who's writing films. Um, 
again, uh, most of the films in the last decade have been written by men. Uh, we've seen a trend upward, but still we have a long way to go in terms of achieving parity. Um, and most of the films are also being written by white people. So uh, again, we're excited to see that there's a pretty steep climb in the last three years. And we're hoping that that means there's a uh, parity for BIPOC and women um, screenwriters in the near future. Hopefully we'll be able to celebrate that at next year's um, State, of the, State of the Media Summit. Um, and then lastly, when it comes to producers um, in film, we see for women that there's not been a whole lot of progress towards parity that um, women producers have been outnumbered um, four to one when it comes to producing the top films in Hollywood. And we actually don't have any data on BIPOC uh, producers. So that's definitely a need um, data on um, BIPOC producers and, and the top films from the last 10 years. Okay, I'm gonna keep blowing through this, the state of television. So what we know is that television um, has similar trends and similar findings. Uh, overall, there is a need for more representation across identities, but we do see better representation than film. Um, so you can see with women, we're inching closer and closer to parity when it comes to women characters in TV. Um, and when it comes to women's screen times, it's not quite as good as we want it to be, but you can see it's, we're starting to get closer and closer. Um, for BIPOC characters, uh, this, this finding was mirrored in film as well, but this last two years, we've seen, we've seen parody for BIPOC characters in TV, which is incredible. And again, um, we hope that that trend continues and that the quality of that representation is, is good for all of the BIPOC characters that are being written in. When it comes to screen time by skin tone, we still see that uh, white, or that characters with light skin tones are outnumbering um, characters with medium and dark skin tones quite a bit. Um, this is another great finding that in the last three years, LGBTQ plus characters in TV have been well represented. So we, are, we love to see that over the baseline um, of the US population. But again, when it comes to characters with disabilities in TV, just like in film, they're almost entirely missing. Uh, characters 50 plus, we almost saw parody in the 15, 16 season, but not quite. Um, there's not been a whole lot of progress over this decade, but we're getting closer to parody. Um, and when it comes to screen time in TV uh, for age, again, even though more and more characters over 50 are being cast in TV, uh, we're not seeing them have equitable time on the screen. For fat characters in TV, just like film, almost entirely missing. 42.5% is the number we're looking for. And in 2021, it was only 13.4% of characters were fat. And again, only 6.8% of screen time was given to fat characters in 2021. So a long way to go. Behind the scenes, similar trends here. Um, most, the vast majority of shows are created by men um, and not a whole lot of, of progress in the last decade. When it comes to shows being created by BIPOC, uh, creators, we see even fewer. So 8.4% uh, of shows were created by BIPOC creators in 2021. When it comes to who's directing shows, we see some improvement for women over the decade um, uh, and some improvement for BIPOC directors too, but still not, not quite parity. Um, and then who's writing TV shows? Um, we're, women are almost going to achieve parity. We're hopefully going to celebrate that soon. And we do see a steady trend upwards over the last decade. And let's see, 45.3% in 2021. Ah, my goodness, my deck doesn't want me to succeed today. Here we go. Um, and last for TV, writers um, of TV in the last decade, we see again, a steady trend towards um, parity for BIPOC writers in TV. When it comes to advertising, um, we have one solid um, study from the Gina Davis Institute that benchmarks advertising for all six identities. We see that um, women and BIPOC creators at, have, uh, sorry, excuse me, women and BIPOC characters in advertising have um, slowly increased over time. And actually BIPOC um, characters have seen well, have been well represented in the last three years in advertising. When it comes to LGBTQ plus characters, almost entirely erased, 1.8 compared to 7.1 of the population. The same for uh, characters with disabilities, uh, two, only 2.2% of ads um, depicted a character with a disability. Um, 50, for characters 50 plus, only 7% of those characters um, in advertising were over the age of 50 and fat characters were almost entirely erased too, only 7.2% compared to over 40 in the population. Um, when it comes to video games, we see similar trends. Women are underrepresented in video games um, 
there's a new study from 2020 showing that we've actually, uh, that women are outnumbered four to one and BIPOC characters too are underrepresented in video games. And when we look at um, the other four identities, we've got LGBTQ characters are almost entirely raised from video games, same with characters with disabilities. Um, characters over 50, only 3.2% and only 1.5% of video game characters are fat in 2020. And then the last industry we'll take a look at when my slide, there we go, is, is music. All right, so we have some findings from the state of the music industry, um, both on screen and behind the scenes. On screen meaning performers and artists. When it comes to musical artists from the last decade, women are an, um, very underrepresented in the Billboard Hot 100 year end chart. But we actually have seen some great numbers for BIPOC artists over the last 10 years. And um, the amount of BIPOC artists in the Hot 100 um, Billboard has almost doubled um, in the decade, which is great. When we look at behind the scenes in the music industry, um, there's some data on women songwriters and producers. And again, we see the same trend here that women, the vast majority of songs and uh, of music coming out of the, um, the top, the hot 100 year end chart has been written and produced by men um, with very little progress um, towards parity for women. And that is all I have from you, for you. Thank you for listening to that. Um, and we're really excited to share this report um, with you. So please, uh, I think it's in the chat and I'm happy to pass it over to the panelists. Thank you. Thank you, Rebecca. And if folks have questions about the methodology, the sampling methodology, the machine learning that we use for screen time, um, how we're calculating various things, video games, ads, et cetera, um, please feel free to ask. At the end, we just put your questions in the Q&A throughout. So let's jump to our expert panel. Uh, I am just so honored today to be introducing uh, these folks. We're going to learn a lot. Um, first, uh, starting with Soraya Jacardi, she is a researcher, an educator, a consultant, and a speaker working in both media and entertainment and nonprofit circles. Uh, she is a senior researcher at the Norman Lear Center at USC Annenberg School of Communication and Journalism. Um, here, she is a part of the Media Impact Project team. Previously, she worked as the Associate Director of Research at the Gina Davis Institute on Gender and Media and has worked with content creators, ad agencies, and nonprofits like the Representation Project, Promundo, and Plan International. As a media scholar, Soraya's work focuses on representation in media and how these representations contribute to real world attitudes and behaviors. She has very unique training for this space uh, as a developmental psychologist. She provides a framework for understanding the role of media throughout the lifespan, particularly uh, with a focus on childhood and adolescence. And her work as a distinguished scholar has been published in peer reviewed journal articles, including the psychology, um, sorry, the psychology of women quarterly and emerging adulthood, uh, media psychology, the psychology of men and masculinities and sex roles. Um, in her spare time, Soraya can be found kayaking, exploring nature, or sleeping with the lights on after binging too many true crime podcasts. Um, Next, and I'm going alphabetically here, Dr. Nicole Amber Haggard is an award-winning instructor, speaker, and published researcher with 16 years of study contextualizing the intersection of race and gender in American culture. Uh, Dr. Nicole is a faculty member in the Film, Media, and Social Justice Program at Mount St. Mary's University, and she's the former Director of Communications for the Gina Davis Institute on Gender and Media. And in 2018, Dr. Nicole co-founded the Center for Intersectional Media and Entertainment, uh, pronounced See Me, great title. Uh, this organization is dedicated to advancing representation. Uh, of course, See Me is one of the partners of this event. Um, in addition to Dr. Nicole's speaking and writing, she is also a featured expert for outlets such as Variety, Glamour, The Wrap, uh, in NBC. She is currently completing a groundbreaking research project with Amazon Films and the Sea Change Institute, so maybe we can ask her more about that. Um, and also uh, now introducing Monica Lay. Monica is a co-founder of the Center for Intersectional Media and Entertainment, so see me, and also the Vice President of Film at Miramax, where she sees uh, the develop oversees the development and production of features like He's All That, and Mattson Tomlin's uh, Mother Android, which I loved. 
Uh, she joined Miramax from MGM, where she worked on such legendary franchises as Legally Blonde and Candyman. Uh, prior to that, uh, Monica was an executive at Paramount and Warner Brothers, and she launched her career at QED International and WME. Uh, she's also worked as an independent producer. Her credits include The Art of Self-Defense and the documentary Recorder, The Marion Stokes Project. Uh, Monica Hells uh, from Long Beach, California, and she earned her MBA from USC's Marshall School of Business and her BA from Stanford University. What an incredible panel. Woo, let's jump right into it. Question for you, Soraya. Your research focuses a lot on impact. Um, tell us about the power of media for folks who say, look, it's just entertainment. I go in to turn off my brain. I go into the theater. I sit on my couch. Tell us why media matters so much. Thank you for the question. Um, so, you know, to put it plainly, we humans, we're social creatures, which means that from the moment that we are born, we're observing the world around us to understand our place in it, right? And we learn, just like we learn from our parents and we learn from our peers and our schools and our communities, we also learn from the media that we observe. Um, and in fact, media can actually give us the access to people and experiences that we may not have in real life. So we may even be learning about other people and other um, experiences that we haven't personally lived through or witnessed through media. And there are decades of media research that demonstrate that media impacts not just the way that we see ourselves, but also the way that we see others. And that this impact can be across a really broad range of domains, from how we feel about our bodies, to our career aspirations, and even intentions around policy support and voting. Um, so for example, the Norman Lear Center found in some previous work that people who watched a two-story um, story arc in Madam Secretary that dealt with the issue of family separation at the border were more likely than those who weren't exposed to that episode to attend an immigration rally or to go to an immigration related community event. So I think that, um, you know, if you haven't seen Chimamanda uh, Ngozi Adichie's TED Talk, it's a great place to start, but I think she said it best when she said, many stories matter. Stories have been used to dispossess and to malign, but stories can also be used to empower and to humanize. Stories can break the dignity of a people, but stories can also repair that broken dignity. Mm, thank you, Soraya. Um, throwing it over to you, Monica. You're in the industry, right? Mm -hmm. uh, you know these stats like the back of your hand in terms of where we've made progress, where we need to make progress. Can you tell us about what's happening in the industry, the big shifts that you've seen or programs that you've seen effectively address these issues of representation? Mm -hmm. Of course, thanks. Um, I think that uh, there is certainly hope in the industry. I think that there's a recognition that audiences are craving content that is more diverse and representative of the people who are actually viewing the content. Um, and people in positions like mine at studios and production companies, agencies, all these institutions are really trying to uh, address that demand um, and show that we are listening. And so, you know, almost every studio, almost every company now has a DNI group um, and is putting real resources behind it. Um, there are diversity programs at many studios. So there's directors workshops like the ones at Warner Brothers and CBS, NBC has their writers initiatives and all of these programs are really fantastic and they show a commitment to hiring and promoting from within the company and, and trying to find diverse talent. But to me, what really, makes a difference is hiring decision makers who are more diverse. And one of the issues um, that uh, I find really fascinating and, and difficult to surmount is that at the top Hollywood companies, the leaders are still mostly white, mostly male. Um, I think it's something around 20% of the leaders at top Hollywood companies are female. 10% of them are BIPOC. And until those numbers change, until you have people in those positions who are able to say, I want to hire directors and writers and stars who are more diverse and put them be behind and in front of the camera, um, I don't think we're going to have real change. And those numbers have been stagnant for a while, um, but I think the industry does recognize that there is a pipeline issue and there are all these training programs to help source and then train up that those individuals. I'm a result of some of those programs. So um, 
there is hope, I think. <laughs> what I hear you saying is it really needs to happen at the top, right? So we've got DEI, we've got incubate, we've got programs in place, but really what we need is a focus on executives in, in the various studios. I think so. Great. Okay. So some concrete, we'll be pulling out the concrete <laughs> advice, right? As we go through, uh, Dr. Nicole, you have been researching this topic, teaching this topic, um, for almost two decades. Uh, talk to us about what progress you have seen, what has been effective. So I want to echo what Monica said about the hope. And I see the hope being in the next generation, like the next generation is prepared for what's coming next. And so if you're not being prepared for them, you're not preparing, right? And what they're prepared for is to be well aware and embedded in exactly what Soraya is talking about. They can speak clearly and they understand what it feels like to not be seen on screen. They understand symbolic annihilation and what that does to you as an individual. Um, so for people like Sarai and Munika who grew up not seeing themselves on screen, right? As women of color were completely erased or people like Rebecca and myself who were stigmatized as fat characters, right? Like what does it feel like to consume this media that's constantly telling you either you're invisible, you don't exist or you're not worthy, you're not deserving of love and these negative stereotypes and these patterns, what they do to people. So this next generation, they are so aware of it. And I'll give you an example why. So like they're taking classes with people like me, right? Who are like so passionate about it. So I teach a class called Race, Sex and Hollywood. And then they're like, I'll never be able to see media again. I would never make media again, right? We did the research study with Amazon Films. We included a group of 25 students from across the country in this project they get it, they are on top of it and they are doing work that's advancing their awareness and their commitment to doing something. So that's where I see the inspiration is this next generation is ready. And they're going to be making those changes, not just in a DEI program, there are programs like at Disney where they have a group who's literally, they don't even call themselves DEI, right? They're just like the awareness group and they do it from the conception all the way to the toys that are being manufactured, right? Like they are with the project the entire way. And these kids are going to be ready to step into those roles and be leaders. And I'm excited about that. Yay. Okay. Optimism. I love it. Um, Christine, I'm putting you on the spot. Uh, I know it, you have been in the industry for a long time as a director, as a writer, as a producer. Um, you've worked on a lot of big productions. Um, where do you think the sticking points are in terms of barriers and challenges for women, for women of color, for people of color, for underrepresented, marginalized groups? Where are the challenges? Well, I don't know if the study addressed this. I know in past studies that we presented, we have teased out the um, communities of Pacific Islander communities, Asian, Native Americans, I still think there's gross underrepresentation of those communities and all across the board. Um, and I think there's major work that needs to be done in the trans community. Uh, and um, personally, as a filmmaker myself, I'm starting to try to address the stereotypes and fetishization of the Pacific Islander community and so there's there's something that you know that I'm becoming more passionate about um, I'd like to advocate for studies that reflect and I'm sure there are many but but maybe that we could expand on a little bit in the next year or in the coming um, months I'd like to advocate for studies that reflect representation in those gatekeeper institutions such as studios and agencies and even at major film festivals um, and finally, maybe how those numbers correlate to revenues, uh, because a lot of people ask about that. I mean, in the nonprofit sector, which I've worked, diversity accretes value. And so we, I, I have a feeling, and I'm sure that it does in all other industries as well, including um, the, the film and, and media industries. Um, but, uh, and I also would like to see a study about the efficacy of diversity pr programs. Um, I've been involved with programs that work and some don't, that some that aren't very properly um, uh, set up to really address the real needs. And, and I do wanna um, put that out there because a lot of people are making mistakes and a lot of program people wanna do these programs and more power to them but some are, can be, um, you know, if they're not 
run properly and if they're not really sincere or you're not working with professionals like these women, then they can actually do more harm than good. I, so I want to be positive. I'm grateful for all the, <laughs> the efforts that are happening, but I think we also need to be cautious about um, progress and we need to scrutinize it. Right, not just check boxes, we need yeah. effective programs. Yep, absolutely. Okay, so two round the horn questions and then we'll jump into audience questions. The first one, um, and we'll go in the same order. Um, what are you and your organization doing to address issues of the underrepresentation of, of marginalized groups and how can we support your work? Like if you can give us ideas about how we can you know, follow you and your personal work and also what your organization is doing. So we'll start with you, Soraya, the Lear Center. Um, so the Norman Lear Center at USC is a research and public policy center that studies the social, the political, and the cultural impact of entertainment. And we have two branches that are important to know about. We have a research and evaluation arm called the Media Impact Project. And we also have an outreach arm, which is called Hollywood Health and Society. And I mention that because they have different channels on social media. So you can follow both the Media Impact Project and Hollywood Health and Society. Um, and Hollywood Health and Society, our outreach side, is a completely free resource that connects writers and creators to subject matter experts who can help these creators tell more authentic stories and they have you can go to their website you can see all the shows that they've worked on but it's I'm still to this day amazed that it's a completely free resource um, and you should if you're a creator um, a writer you should definitely check them out and then we also have the Media Impact Project, which is where I'm housed, and we study the stories, um, regardless of what platform they're on, whether it's film or television or news, and we look at their impact on audiences. So not just what's present in media, but also how it shapes the attitudes, the knowledge, intentions, and behaviors, and in particular, through what mechanisms. And understanding those mechanisms is really important um, because, for example, we know that media effects, regardless of what outcomes you're looking at, media effects are heightened if you provide people with a beloved character that's recurring, that people can form a relationship with and kind of grow to love. Um, but those same media effects are weakened if people are very reactive to the storyline. So if the storyline feels too preachy or too manipulative, then there go your media effects, right? So understanding those mechanisms is really important. And in terms of um, representation, to give you a more specific example, we are entering our third round of research with Define America that is looking at television portrayers portrayals of immigrants on television and how it impacts real life attitudes towards immigrants and immigrant centered policies. And you can support this work um, by following us on social media, but also by going to the mediaimpactproject.org and taking a look at our resources, our reports, sharing them with others, especially if you yourself are a creator or know any creators, sharing these resources with them and just talking about these issues with people in your life. Thank you, Soraya. How about you, Dr. Nicole? Uh, Monica, you want to introduce me and then I'll talk about what we're working on? Cool. Absolutely. Um, so Nicole and I work together with our third co-founder, Joy Donnell, um, who unfortunately wasn't able to join us today. Um, and we co-founded the Center for Intersectional Media and Entertainment to really address the fact that intersectional representation um, in the media and entertainment space wasn't uh, being discussed um, very frequently. And so our approach really brings together a number of groups that tend to operate in their own uh, fields um, and kind of talk to one another and uh, operate in these echo chambers. Um, and so you can see from our co-founders that we uh, come from a number of different disciplines. I myself work within the industry um, in production and development. Joy comes from a marketing and production background and Nicole is an academic. So our goal is really to bring together, um, we call them the five A's. So it's artists, uh, academics, activists, audiences, and allies within the industry to really affect change. Um, and so Nicole's going to go into how we do that a little bit with some of our more specific programs. Yeah, and you can follow us at at CME clearly at CIME clearly. Um, and so two things that we're excited about that are coming. One is definitely related to what Rebecca was talking about. It's like, why do stories matter in the first place, right? So we like to say like, yay, there were seven more Latinas on screen this year. But if they're all drug dealers, wives and maids, 
have we actually made progress, right? Like, what does that look like? So we're really invested in telling the history of the stories that we tell about specific bodies and where those patterns are. Um, so we started it doing a project with Amazon Films and Sea Change where we were testing out some methodology. And now we are launching um, our own big research project. We like to say that it's kind of similar to the um, 1619 project where what they did to slavery, we want to like retell the history of Hollywood and why it matters, right? And like really just reframe how we understand how we got here in the first place. Um, and a lot of people don't know that for a long time, um, Hollywood had rules in place that really restricted who could be on screen and who could be on screen together and what that looked like. And now we base everything, all of our decisions on what came previously, right? Like if it's sold in the past, it'll sell now. But we're, if we're not acknowledging that there was a long period in which we were literally censoring what could come on screen in the first place, then the decisions that we are basing those on come from a very embarrassing period in Hollywood's history, um, which isn't in alignment with the future that we want to see. So we want to retell that history by doing some amazing research that really digs into what those patterns are so that we can um, use that data to alleviate ourselves from repeating the same mistakes. Um, and then the other piece of it that we're excited about is financial allyship. Um, and so a lot of this is all about the money, right? And how do we support creators that, that want to move forward and, and do the work and just need that you know, if you go on Indiegogo, a lot of times they just need $600 to finish their film, right? To be able to take it to the next step. So yeah, there are these big money ways, but there's also these micro funding ways. Um, and so we are starting something called the Scenic Creators Fund, which will allow people to um, participate in a fund that gives these micro grants um, to these creators who are looking for this money and who are doing the work that that is advancing representation, which is what we're all about. So follow us and stay tuned. <laughs> that is awesome. Um, and last question for everybody um it, which is what were we impressed with in 2022 what shows were we watching mm -hmm. what kind of blew our minds in terms of representation Soraya we'll start with you and then go to Christine um so obviously you know two movies that we've all been talking about um recently and Kanto and Turning Red those two were phenomenal um I've also you know I, I know we talked about this earlier um Abbott Elementary is wonderful Bob Hart's Abishola on CBS I believe is also a really um interesting representation also of immigrants um and uh Pen15 if you haven't seen that um that show has wrapped up its last season um but I think it's just it does such a great job of representing the struggle of figuring out your identity during a very awkward period of life mm -hmm. um so it's it's a great show um all of those things have been you know kind of stood out to me this past year great thank you Soraya Christine what are you watching that, that impressed you in 2022 what should we be watching and Becca's next oh you know the the program that I really love is Hacks and I'll tell you what because it is about aging in Hollywood. Mm -hmm. And um, for some reason, I identify with the Jane Smart character and um, the young woman, I can't remember her name, but I, I think I wanna see more. I mean, these numbers are saying we need to see more of older characters um, in, in media and they're, you know, they're rich stories. So I would say Hacks and all the, the programs that Soraya mentioned as well in Canto. Yeah amazing yeah thank you um becca with monica on deck i think so there's a lot but the one that comes to my mind right now is ted lasso um and there's there have been some other um shows the this last year too that kind of explore softer and different versions of masculinity in ways that i think are really give me hope especially with some of the other awful depictions of masculinity um, and toxic masculinity in media that we see all the time. So Ted Lasso is the one I would recommend watching if you want something feel good, but also some new depictions of sports and masculinity. Yeah, great. Uh, Monica, what should we be watching? What impressed you? Yeah, I love the increase in uh, subtitled content that yes. is becoming really big. Um, so, you know, of course, it's Squid Game and Money Heist and All of Us Are Dead and um, so much incredible content out there. Um, and I think it's really shifting how people are watching uh, media and what they're open to seeing on screen. Um, and I think that makes a huge difference. And then a couple of things I'm excited about for this year are there's the um, 
there's the story she said, which is the telling of um, how Megan Dewey and Jody Cantor reported on Weinstein's being directed by a woman, Maria Schrader. Um, and then another female directed movie I'm really excited about is The Woman King, which is coming out this later later this year, Gina Prince Bikewood, Viola Davis as a queen, which is what she is, so. <laughs> yes. yes. How about you, Dr. Nicole? I was obsessed with the L word generation Q. Mm -hmm. You have a scene where a trans male is picking up a wheelchair brown, wheelchair bound Latino woman to go have sex with her. And she's like, you better bring it. You can't break me as he's, he's walking him up the stairs, right? Just like this totally shift in these stories that we're used to seeing. And the whole thing is so great. Other things that I think are super fascinating and fun to watch are like love is blind and the ultimatum because they just like show how entrenched these stereo these gender roles are and how they're impacting us as human beings and not serving us so with a critical eye i have fun watching this yes oh that's you know we do it for work yes. we do it for work <laughs> um i'll add we are lady parts to that list uh just an incredible show i'm also late to snowfall and it's complicated but i just love yeah. just you know worlds dominated um, by people who aren't white. Like that's actually, you know, Los Angeles is a majority uh, minority town, right? So it feels like, it feels like home. I, I love um, shows that are getting the green light that just wouldn't have gotten the green light, you know, 20 years ago. Let's jump into some of these questions from the audience. If you have questions, pop them in. We will get to all of them. Uh, question from an attendee. Have there been inquiries into whether these representations are positive, whether the represent the underrepresentations are uh, finally shown? Are they fully realized characters or just a token sidekick? So the Representation Project's done a ton of work on tropes and stereotypes and storylines. I know the Norman Lear Center has as well. Simi has. Um, who wants to jump in on this question? Becca, do you want to talk a little bit about tropes and stereotypes and then Dr. Nicole or anyone else who wants to jump in? Sure. Um, yeah, as Caroline mentioned, we the, at the Rep Project are always looking at both the amount of representation, but also the quality of that representation. So, and that's not just in scripted shows too. In our Olympics um, Respect Her Game report, we're looking at how often female athletes are being um, shown in primetime coverage, but also are they being sexualized? Are they being talked about in demeaning um, and infantilizing terms? Are they being respected when they're covered? And so that, um, that it needs to exist when we talk about media representations in all of these industries. Of course, our, that would turn our state of media report card into a 1000 page document, but there is so much incredible work out there um, delving deeper into what this what tropes and stereotypes mean. Um, and in the conversation around whether there can be good tropes or stereotypes, I, you know, I, you know, when we're doing this work, we are of the mind that um, any trope or stereotype that is based on an identity is reducing a character um, to that identity and is limiting and dehumanizing dehumanizing. And so we argue that um, that flipping these stereotypes and tropes is imperative and, and presenting characters across all identities. And also I will say um, in intersectional ways um, that that flip intersectional stereotypes too, right? Because there are tropes and stereotypes that pop up for women. Um, there are tropes and stereotypes that pop up for fat women, for black women, for Latinx women, um, for older characters that are queer, right? All of, the, all of these marginalized identities um, overlap in ways that create um, problematic representation. So it's important that we talk about it and there's um, plenty of research out there. I can drop some in the chat maybe um, that I would recommend you look at if you wanna learn more about that. Thank yeah, you. and just like providing like a concrete example of what Becca's talking about, right? Like when we think about what we're so tired of seeing stereotypes of women being saved, right? And rescued. And we don't want to see that anymore. And like, we need empowering female characters. But then you have a lot of black women saying, no, I actually would love to see a character of me being saved and somebody supporting me and loving me and nurturing me in that way. So when you pay attention to intersectionality in these patterns, right? You can call them st tropes, stereotypes, whatever. They're just patterns. It's stuff that we've seen over and over and over again. And then it ends up living in our bodies and in our minds and impacting the way we live our lives, right? And that's why they're so important. And so really being able to tether out, like the data, the numbers data gives us such great clues as to where to look, right? Like what are these repeated storylines that we keep, we keep doing around specific bodies, right? And, and that's the, the fun stuff to really start looking there so that we can do something different. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so Samwet Boy uh, has commented in the chat, 
uh, Becca, that um, Ted Lasso also has really positive representations of mental uh, health issues. Um, I love the black psychologist woman who, you know, there were a few articles written about how common that role is in terms of casting black women. Um, and I'm, you know, yes, uh, black women as medical professionals. Yes, we want to see more of that in the world. Um, and Dr. Nicole, as you point out, right, it's it's intersectional, right? We want we want um, to see it for a lot of reasons. One of which, a thing that keeps coming up is the content is so much more interesting yes. when you tell the story, more authentic stories. Um, just pretty straightforward, way more interesting. So not surprising that diversity uh, in lots of different ways has been linked to uh, profit, right? Okay, so Daryl has a question. Uh, the 0.3% of LGBTQ plus characters in video games is pretty wild to me. How did the study account for characters when you could choose your own path and make characters uh, queer uh, based on in-game choices? Great question, Daryl. I worked on this study. Soraya worked on this study. Becca worked on this study. Soraya, do you want to talk about the sampling of the video game study or pass it off to Becca? So um, I'll answer the question to the best that I can remember, but I'll hand it over to Becca if, if I'm missing any gaps. Um, so this study was looking at, at um, streamers on Twitch. So already looking at people that were playing, we were not taking into account the process of actually selecting characters, selecting how you want to dress your character, selecting how you want your character to behave. All of that is really important, but it's a much more complicated, you know, study with a different type of methodology. The study that we were doing was just examining the existing play that was being streamed by players on Twitch, if that makes sense. Yes, and all of the games that made it into, so all of the, it was the most popular Twitch players for a month of streaming, and all of the games they were playing were in the top 10 games um, being sold in the nation during that month. All of them made were the, were the top games. Um, Beck, I don't know if you want to speak, uh, provide more detail about that methodology. Yeah, so um, there was, so I think there was like a 27,000 characters from that study that we're looked at. And, and sorry, I was right that for the most part, the random sampling of streaming content, I think they averaged like each streamer averaged like 50 hours a week of streaming. So there was so much um, and the random sample covered mostly existing gameplay, but we did also code for when characters would make decisions about their if, if we happen to have a scene where they are choosing their character that would have been captured in there, but there, it just we just didn't see, there wasn't even a whole lot to do in terms when we're talking about quality of, of, of representation for LGBTQ plus characters because characters, they were just completely missing and so not even showing up as options in the games that were being played. So video games is really hard to uh, obviously measure it because there is so much choice involved, which is why uh, the choice was made to go to um, what the popular representations that we were seeing on Twitch with the top uh, streamers um, with the assumption that if they're playing the top games that their play is going to look similar, it's going to be representative of broader play. Um, Nanashka has a question. Um, can you speak to any content you have found that depicts specific Islander and South Southeast Asian communities in authentic ways and also adds indigenous communities? Um, we are doing uh, an Asian Women in Media panel next week looking at that intersection. Um, so some of the shows that we're gonna be recommending obviously to to all the boys I've loved before, Laura Jean, um, and all of the, the, the uh, Korean American characters on that show, uh, Gia from Love, Lovecraft Country, Violet from As We See It, who um, is uh, playing an Asian American character um, who is uh, on the, um, the autism spectrum, uh, Eve Polanski and Killing Eve, they just wrapped up the, you know, a lot of controversy about the, uh, the end of that show, a number of characters on Kim's Convenience, I know there's some controversy about representations, my favorite is probably uh, the Mother Uma, um, but other folks may have recommendations, anyone else want to jump in here? Yeah, I would jump in with, um, there's a film that hit Netflix recently called Definition Please, um, which is uh, about some South Asian characters, South Asian American. Um, and there's another network film, I think it's on Fox, called, or TV show, sorry, called The Cleaning Lady um, that is about 
uh, that stars a Cambodian actress and she plays an immigrant from Cambodia who went to the Philippines, fell in love with someone there, and then um, came to the United States uh, for work and is struggling to send money back to her family in the Philippines and in Cambodia. So um, I think that those are some really interesting and nuanced depictions of some Southeast Asian and South Asian characters. Yeah, I'm going to jump in just to also recommend Never Have I Ever. Um, and I saw in the Q&A, there was another question also about indigenous representation. You have um, Reservation Dogs and Rutherford Falls. Those are shows um, with native actors, but also with native writers um, that are, are, are wonderful. And you should check those out as well, too. Great. And Christine, I know you're working on a project that tells a story um, about a family, an Indigenous family. Um, can you tell us a little bit about that project? I know it's not out yet. No, I'm going to shoot it this summer called the Ali'i King. And I'm working, got support from Pacific Islanders and Communications, Ohina Film Labs and Creative Labs of Hawaii. So I'm very excited. And it's about an immigrant uh, family. Um, of Hawaiians and Germans living in the Hawaiian diaspora. And so I haven't seen a lot of stories about depicting um, the 50% of Hawaiians who live outside of Hawaii. So that's what I'm gonna take a stab at. All right, wonderful. A um, couple of other questions in the chat. Some, uh, Victoria says, I would love to see statistics on women in Twitch uh, game streams and their percentage of harassing comments. Um, there is a, a great article by Sonia Campbell and her colleagues, seven co-authors, called The Downsides of Being a Female Streamer, an Automated Content Analysis Approach to Sexual Harassment in Female Twitch Streamers Chat Logs. So that study exists, um, which is it's great what we can do now with machine learning as well. Um, also, there is a, a comment or a question. Um, what do you think of the popular stories of real female sociopaths rising? So I think this is like true crime, right? Inventing Anna, the dropout. Does that go hand in hand with the rejection or reanalysis of girl boss culture? Is it also beneficial to see women as villains sometimes? Who wants to jump in on that juicy question? Yes. I do. I'm obsessed with this right now. We've been talking about this a lot in class, right? With like inventing Anna and the dropout, two women who are going into the investor space, trying to get money to do something. And we know that women, somebody get me the statistic, right? Right. I think it's like less than 7% that women get money in that sector. Um, and invent, and they both went about it, the gender issue of it in really interesting ways. Right. So like inventing Anna did a whole episode where she's like living with the fire Island dude. Right. And like, she changes who she, who she presents herself as because she's addressing these gender inequalities. So they really went hard on that in one episode, which was enjoyable to watch. And then the dropout did it the opposite approach. They were like, one woman can ruin it for all women, right? So it's really interesting to see, yes, where we see these trends of these two stories emerging at the same time, which like you say, kind of makes you feel like, well, why are we telling all these stories about these psychopathic women who are starting these companies and it's horrible and did it, right? Like, so you can definitely go there and also see like what work are they attempting to do and, and is that shifting um, how we're thinking about that? So, and I think it's always beneficial to see women as villains. It's, it's beneficial to see people as complicated people. That's what's beneficial because we are and that's how you do great storytelling. Amen, anyone else wanna jump in? Women as villains? Yes. My only, my only comment about that is that it is somewhat disturbing to see these young, the, there's this kind of fear of young women, beautiful mm. women, luring these smart, successful people in. And that is a bit the siren trope. Yeah, because that's the real issue is the lack of investors investing in women, right? And that's where it needs to be refocused. Yeah too because that's like it's insane that when you look at those our friend Denise Hewitt who started scripted and had to close it down for that reason right like she did a, a really great op-ed on this just like comparing it it's like it's there's so many issues in so many industries right so, yeah. so uh just to cap um everything we've been talking about here uh state of media summit the report card is available um, on our website it'll be available on the CME website uh we've put it in the chat 
Um, the REP project is also running monthly sessions focusing on the intersections of women and um, race, um, looking at sexuality, looking at age, looking at ability. Um, as I mentioned, we have our AAPI Women in Media panel next week. Um, and the reason that we're kind of digging deep is, is the reason that See Me exists, right? And the reason that Sarai is so intersectional in her work. Um, because uh, this is where um, the next stage or the next frontier of understanding media represent, representation lies. It's in the, in the complexity of identity and representation. So I would strongly encourage everyone to check out our fact sheets, to check out the work of CME, uh, to go to the Norman Lear Center website, um, because there's just an abundance of information and our report card puts it all in one place. Um, Christine, I'm going to pass the baton to you to send us off today. <laughs> Well, I can't thank you all enough for the work that you do. And I, you know, I feel very inspired. I'm, I'm grateful that I got a chance to kind of be part of the ground floor of starting the media summit. But each year when I get together with you and hear all the, the work that you've done, it just, I, I'm, I'm very moved and touched. And I know many people who are listening feel the same way. So I'm just a big, huge fan. And I just want to thank you so much for continuing the good work and keeping up the good fight. Ah, oh, thank you, Christine. It's great to be in the trenches working for better representation with you. Uh, and Dr. Nicole, last word, partners at CME. Ah, oh, it is. It's so fun. I'm so grateful that y'all like put all the data together. It makes teaching easier too, right? Like we finally have a place where you can go and like really just see it quickly. It's hard to go and read all those studies and understand them. And now we can really see it. And I think it allows people to take action steps to move forward from those because then they can access the data themselves. So I'm super grateful to y'all, the Norman Lear Center, you guys do amazing work. And I'm super excited for what's coming next for CME and the changes that we're, we're gonna be able to, to make. So please follow us and join us in this movement. Yay, follow all these amazing, uh, brilliant women on social media and their organizations. And we'll see y'all next year, hopefully in person. Okay, hopefully. Thank you all. <laughs> Bye everybody. Bye. Bye.